Hi, my name is Dan Blondell. I am the CEO of Nano One Materials. Nano One is a, a Canadian technology company uh, with based on the West Coast in Burnaby, British Columbia, just outside of Vancouver, with manufacturing facilities now in Quebec, just outside of Montreal. And we are developing technology to improve the way that lithium ion battery cathode materials are made. Um, in doing so, um, we are bringing a solution to the market that can improve um, the uh, security of so supply, the supply chain, uh, the cost, the environmental footprint, and uh, we can drive down a complexity um, in the uh, in the manufacturing of these cathode materials for lithium ion batteries. Dan, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, nice to have you back on Crux. Uh, uh, Nano was last on uh, Crux about 18 months ago, so there's lots to catch up on. Um, and very nice to meet you. It's the first time I've actually spoken to you. So um, very much looking forward to the next uh, half an hour or so. Um, but perhaps let's start with a little bit of just kind of background to today's news release, because uh, you've put out quite a big news release today. The share price has reacted favorably. But um, uh, I, I, let's not labor the point. But if you could just come kind of summarize the last, uh, well, 2022 uh, that'd be really helpful. Yeah. Well, l last time we spoke was in late in 2021. And at about that time, we had a whole bunch of activities uh, underway um, um, behind closed doors that manifested themselves in 2022. And that uh, um, basically the, the acquisition of the manufacturing facility in uh, in Quebec that was owned by Johnson Matthey. That was Johnson Matthey Battery Materials Canada. And we bought their Canadian division, which was essentially... Uh, uh, an LFP manufacturing plant and people, uh, which is really key to this uh, deal. And I can get to that in a little bit more detail, but that's what uh, that's the uh, uh, that all started almost uh, a year and a half ago. Uh, the the dealings on that. At the same time, we were also uh, bringing uh, Rio Tinto across the line as an investor and strategic partner. Um, and they invested 10 million US in the company. Uh, we announced that last June, about the same time we announced the Johnson Matthey acquisition. And further to that, uh, we have uh, we brought BASF on board as a uh, as a partner, a joint development partner, uh, developing technology to make their cathode materials. And then later in the, the year, last year, we also brought on uh, we brought on Umicore as a an, an other joint development uh, partner. Um, to, I can get into quite a bit more detail on all of those, but uh, maybe I'll just kind of throw it back to you uh, to keep the conversation yeah, yeah. bilateral. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's lots of opportunities for monologue here. Um, there's, there's, you've got a lot of information in your head. Um, so um, that's a really interesting um, approach by Rio Tinto, kind of putting the 10 million into into this space because it's just, it, it's just this is. Um, extremely non-core for them. What was their rationale for that? Well, I'd say, I'd say where we really came together with on, was on lithium iron phosphate. That's one of the types of cathode materials, and that's kind of a, that's an, uh, basically lithium iron and phosphorus combined together to make a cathode material. It's one of the longest lasting, safest, and uh, and lowest cost of all the cathode materials. <clears throat> really has applications wherever there is um, sort of heavy duty charging, discharging industrial applications. Um, small batteries in in in, uh, uh, in in cars that need to be charged more often, for instance, and and things like that. The the key here is that uh, Rio Tinto is not only building out their uh, lithium business. I think as anyone who was following them closely in the space knows, but they're also um, uh, they're also a, a very large manufacturer of, of iron and particularly iron iron metal powder. So this is class one automotive grade iron metal powder. And the two companies, Nano One and Rio Tinto, came together really with the vision of, of marrying that uh, stream of iron metal powder that's actually produced in Quebec, and um, uh, using it, uh, developing it as feedstock for our lithium iron phosphate. And it, what it does, is it creates a um, uh, a very wholesome North American supply chain. Uh, there's a there's a refined metal uh, that's ready and able to go into cathode material. You can't say that for almost any other cathode material today uh, in North America. So uh, we, what we saw here is a really a big opportunity. But there's not much lithium being produced in North America. I mean, you've got Albemarle no. and um, you've got, um, I think, Otia is just the most recent mine that started. Do you have a plan for Canadian or, or kind of a line of sight on Canadian lithium? Uh, we're working with uh, all of the players. And, and, and obviously, as they come online, as we come online, I think some of the timing will work out reasonably well. As our volumes start to pick up, we'll start to see, uh, we'll start to see um, some of those Canadian... <clears throat> 
um, uh, sort of junior mining companies uh, come up to speed. Um, uh, we, we have relationships with uh, many of the other sort of uh, reliable and known suppliers uh, who can easily feed into the North American market. And currently we do tap some of them for the smaller volumes we're using for testing and evaluation in the plant. LFP, uh, I'm glad we started on that uh, conversation because the, the news today is about your LFP plans in Quebec. You, you, um, you of course, mentioned you picked up the, the, um, the Johnson Matthey uh, battery metals Canada facility at Candiac um, six months ago. Did they? Did you? Did you retain a lot of the staff, or um, um, how, how's that uh, assimilation been in, in, into Nano One? What's the process been over the last six months? Well, listen, it was a full business acquisition. So we acquired the, the plant, the people, the uh, um, the the staff, of course, the um, uh, the land, uh, the facilities, and and everything. I think the most important thing there is actually the people, the the learning curve. That plant's been in operation for 10 years. And so the people um, at the plant, uh, by the average tenure is, is 10, maybe even even longer. Some of them mean there are 17, almost 20 years since they uh, were developing the technology uh, and, and as they built and commissioned the plant. So there's a tremendous amount of experience there in cathode manufacturing. And and actually, it's the, it's the largest, most experienced cathode manufacturing and operational team in North America. Um, uh, at at fifty people, that's not a massive number, but just goes to show you there's uh, how how early stage um, uh, this part of the supply chain really is in North America. So um, the I, I'm happy to report that we had zero people leave between the time that uh, Johnson Matthey announced and um, and we bought it. Um, we did hire a few people out of Johnson Matthey, or, or sort of as uh, basically we, a few people. Uh, had to leave Johnson Matthey earlier during the acquisition. We managed to hire them back, so we have 100% retention in the last year and a half. So, just goes to show you that the really the transition has been very effective. I think we have a we have a, a very strong and dedicated team uh, that's very experienced and very much believe in the vision that Nano One is bringing to the LFP market and, and and to the plant, the future of that plant. Help me out with the because um, you know you've got your own patents, you've got your own technology, you've got the kind of the one pot technology uh, and you talk in your news release about retrofitting the 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 plant in Canada it's in Quebec to get to the point where you can produce um 200 tons per annum um of cathode um how compatible is your technology with their experience of making cathodes and how much of a retrofit job is there um just kind of a bit more detail around that please yeah, that was one of the the unique things about this acquisition. Um, pretty much all of the equipment, uh, basically, the plant had all of the equipment we need to um, uh, to make LFP using the one pot process. We need large reactor tanks um, to mix all the all the materials and chemicals in, uh, spray dryers to dry the product that comes out of those reactor tanks, and then a furnace um, to cook them in the final stage. And uh, that is. Uh, so all, all the components were there, and um, and and I think that made it they're very unique to us. Also, the size of the plant for us was was almost perfectly sized because we were converting it, as you said, to 200 tons per annum, which isn't a lot. Actually, that's a very small number. Um, uh, uh, Ten years ago, that would have been considered relatively large, but these days it's it's a small number. But it becomes a pilot plant for us, a really effective pilot plant to demonstrate the technology, and and. Basically, what we have to do to convert that plant is is replace the reactors. The reactors are there, and we're using them right now for evaluation and testing materials, but they're not chemically compatible with our process. So they will get slightly etched away or whatever it is over, over time. Um, so we will be, we're installing, as we use those uh, reactors and wear them out, essentially, uh, we will be installing new reactors that are, are, are designed specifically for the one-pot process and, they're, uh, and that are chemically compatible. And that takes some time to to um, obviously manufacture, procure those ma- uh, machines, and 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 uh, and stick them in place. But in the interim, we're able to use the plant uh, quite effectively, and the trials that we have underway are are going very well. Can you, for my for my poor ignorant brain, describe the one pot process? Yeah. So the one pot process, um, essentially, the, the name says it all. All, all the reactants go into uh, one reactor at the same time, or well, roughly the same time. So you're adding lithium. Um, uh, iron, your iron source and, and uh, your phosphorus source, which is typically phosphoric acid. Um, and it all is, uh, is brought into, uh, mixed and brought into solution 
where the reactants, uh, where, where the, all the all the materials react to form a slurry of of material. Uh, so this t- turns it into a thick mud, basically. And then we dry that mud in a spray dryer. A spray dryer is really just a um, a device that um, um, that atomizes the the stream of mud uh, into really small droplets in a hot air um, a, a hot air circulating cyclone, and all the water boils off, and you're left with dry dust at the bottom. Uh, we take that dry dust uh, and it's and then it's put into a kiln and fired uh, uh, at, a, at an elevated temperature um, to uh, finalize the the crystal structure and powders. Is there a chemical reaction? Do, do you do under kind of some kind of external influence, whether that's an electric current or a magnetic field, or um, to, to to get the lithium and the iron to, and the and the phosphorus to react, or is it just a simple? Um, chemical reaction that occurs in solution it's simply in in this case it's simply a chemical reaction in solution so it just takes some time for the chemical reaction to proceed but uh, essentially it's a stirred tank um, or a reactor uh, uh, which basically uh, reacts all the chemicals in due course and then once they're fully reacted we're able to dry it and then cook it in the uh, in the final stage in the furnace what is the name of that uh, new mineral that is a kind of lithium iron phosphate is it a um it must have an, an a, a chemical. It, it, kind of it is it is character. lithium iron phosphate. That that is what it is. It's a it's a powder. Oh, that, okay. It's a powder that comes out and and it's known as uh, lithium iron phosphate. It's in a a crystal structure um, that's known as an olivine, and that's not unique to us. That's just how lithium. That's what lithium iron phosphate has to be in an olivine structure in order to work as a cathode material. Um, and we just have a different process for getting there. Okay, so I'm um, I'm a geologist, so I understand what an olivine is. You know, it's a, uh, yes, a, a magnesium <laughs> iron um, aluminum silicate um, in yes. in my language. So it's an olivine structure, but it's okay. So uh, but it's atomized, so you've got a very controlled um, distribution, um, size distribution, and chemical distribution. Okay, and so that, the, that's when correct. You, when so you, every yeah, every go every grain of powder, or and, and basically, or, or even before it gets to the powder, you know, the slurry. It's very homogenous in the sense that the lithium, and the, uh, the lithium and the iron and the phosphorus are all homogeneously distributed and reacted and forming chemical structures um, in in reaction. When we dry them, then you distribute that into small little um, particles of dust, essentially, or, or, or powder. Um, uh, and then the firing process just uh, brings it to final completion. In that final step, um, lithium iron phosphate is, is coated with carbon, and that happens automatically in our process. There's no extra carbon coating step. Uh, the carbon uh, precursor, or the carbon additive, is already in the mixture, and when it fires in the furnace, it uh, it it basically coats the surface of every uh, every particle in, in the in the process. The carbon coating is is really actually one of the it was one of the major inventions, and not not by us. This is a long time ago. It was actually invented in Quebec, but the carbon coating of LFP. Uh, makes it conductive enough to work as a cathode material, and that is that was a key invention uh, that came out of uh, 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 University of Montreal in Hydro Quebec in the um, uh, well o- over twenty years ago because the patents are now all starting to expire on that. And w- which which bit of the process we've, we, you've been describing to me is is patented by Nano One? Uh, I would say that uh, the key part is the is the uh, is the process. And uh, and and the intermediate dried materials as well. So I, you know, when it, when the materials that come out of the uh, out of the reactor and, and are dried, um, those are basically in a unique form that um, uh, that is patentable in some cases. So uh, typically, it's the process to make um, the powders, um, and then we our patents also cover batteries using those powders that use the process. So there's a there's a full range of different patents, but essentially the the core IP is at the process level. Great, thank you. You then end up with a, a powder. What's the? Uh, did you also go to take the next stage to create the the form of the cathode rather than the material for the cathode? Um, so, so what happens? Um, so we're not in the battery making business, but we do take it all the way to battery cells in order to do all of our testing and evaluation. So you can't just um, you can't just uh, uh, measure the material as a powder. Uh, you don't, you won't know until you put it in a battery, and that's one of the things that actually makes. Um, makes cathode production one of the one of the more challenging parts of the supply chain it's not simply uh, unlike a a battery metals play where you are uh you actually have the uh, you know the quality the the quality of your lithium is governed by the in, a number of impurities in it and or the, you know the, the the level of impurities and if you hit a certain spec uh, generally anyone can put it in their battery and um 
Um, but with a cathode material, uh, you have to be, it has to be pure, like, like the input materials. Um, it also has to have a, a certain phase composition, at least the crystal structure, the olamine structure has to be, um, uh, has to be very prevalent. And then it has to perform in a battery. And to do that, you've got to take that powder, you mix it with a binder into kind of an ink-like substance, and it gets coated onto a piece of foil, uh, like aluminum foil, and that's the cathode. Um, uh, and then the anode is made similarly with graphite. The two are sandwiched uh, together with, an, with, a, uh, with a separator between them, and then uh, either rolled or folded into uh, a lithium-ion battery cell, uh, sealed up and uh, filled with electrolyte and then sealed up. Uh, and then activate it. And you've got to take it to that stage and then and then run through a series of tests that can last anywhere from a week to uh, to six months long, depending on the type of uh, cycling tests you're doing on the battery. So we do all of that. However, uh, we do not sell, we're not aiming to sell the batteries. Um, it's just part of the, uh, it's part of the evaluation process that has to happen every time you make a batch of these materials. Have you have you had the time and the, the kind of integration uh, ability to do this run at Candiac, or is this something you've tested at uh, Burnaby in British Columbia? So it, we can kind of think of it in kind of terms of scale. In, in Burnaby in British Columbia, uh, we, we are making cathode materials at a scale. Uh, we're basically innovating, so we do a lot of the process innovation there down at the bench level. So we'll do things in literally um, 100 gram samples, uh, and we will move up to uh, kilogram level scales of, of development in, um, in in Burnaby. We have the capacity to go larger. However, uh, now with Candiac, we can go even larger on there. So there we're, we're, we're going to be able to get up to uh, much larger samples um, because the equipment is much larger. We've literally, we're literally uh, testing in Candiac now that's about 200 times larger. The reactors are 200 times larger than what we can do in, in Burnaby. So um, really, the, all the innovation level stuff happens at, in, in, uh, in the fundamental work happens in, in Burnaby, and then any of the process innovation and the large scale production work um, is going to happen in in Candiac. Uh, quite often, you have to go back to the drawing board if you you know if you run into a problem, then you have to go back and do tests again at the bench level, and then work it all the way back through the process to get it back up to scale. Um, so really, having the two facilities is really fundamental. You need to be able to um, uh, test it. Test at the uh, you know the hundred gram level, then the kilogram level, then the tens of kilograms, and hundreds and two hundreds, and then into the tons and into the tens of thousands and tens of thousands of tons. And so each one of those steps um, comes with its scale up challenges, and where uh, and uh, and you know bit by bit we're resolving all of those and moving forward. And we we feel like uh, uh, most of them are out of our way right now. And uh, with Candiac in 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 play, we uh, uh, will be able to to really kind of use this as a springboard and, and a platform to to launch uh, LFP into much larger volumes and and obviously get the kind of offtake that's going to drive our business and our growth objectives. Do um, Umicor and um, Umicor and uh, BSA, BASF have appetite and the facilities to take on some of your cathode and kind of take it, you're talking about kind of jumping up scales. I mean, are, are they um, taking it a bit further down the uh, downstream to larger scales or is, or is that not part of their investment thesis? So, so it's, a, it's a good question. So the, the way it works, uh, actually we worked this same way with Johnson Matthew before they left the space, um, but BSF and Umicor um, have their uh, patented uh, cathode materials, so they're unique formulations. In, in their case, it's mostly based on um, uh, nickel, manganese, and cobalt uh, type chemistries. Um, but the they have their unique uh, formulations of cathode materials, and they make them using a uh, a fairly conventional method uh, that's used around the world uh, to make those cathode materials. And they are they're working with Nano One, and we're working with them to develop um, a way to make their patented uh, formulations of materials, but using our process. And obviously, that's uh, that's to, to take advantage of our, the benefits we bring, which is to drive down the cost and the complexity, the environmental footprint, the energy intensity, and and really the, re- the reliance on on uh, on foreign jurisdictions. Um, uh, obviously, as supply chains start to localize, um, so it becomes extremely important for us to uh, find. Uh, unique pathways within the supply chain that can make the uh, the national interests more secure. So our process really kind of addresses all of those things, and that is uh, that's really where the interest from BSF and Umocor come from is uh, to make their materials using our process to uh, to take advantage of all those benefits. When you talk about kind of smaller environmental footprint and uh, lower 
energy costs. Um, is that because this one pot technology is quite clever and it's quite hard to replicate um, by by other people in I don't know in Belgium or or Germany or wherever? Yeah. So so maybe maybe it's worth um, dialing uh, basically describing how cathode materials are currently made today and and how we differ because that's uh, it's really important to understand that. So so tip, typically today the and it doesn't matter if it's NMC or LFP. Uh, the lithium is virtually the same, whether it's a lithium carbonate or lithium hydroxide. We can use both, and that's very unique about our process. So um, uh, that's that's certainly one of our benefits. But the the, uh, the 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 iron, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, they typically today they all um, uh, eventually after they've been mined, extracted, um, uh, uh, maybe, maybe cooked, um, uh, they get they get ground in, into powder, dissolved in sulfuric acid to make a sul- uh, basically an iron sulfate or a nickel sulfate or a manganese sulfate, whatever it might be. And those are um, uh, then either um, uh, uh, crystallized through a very energy intensive process to remove all the all the uh, uh, extra water um, and and shipped or um, and then redissolved in sulfuric acid at their final destination to to bring them back into a kind of a liquid form. Uh, in a, into a solution, and then uh, and then mixed with the other sources of let's say let's say the other if, if that's nickel uh, sulfate, then it's mixed with a stream of iron sulfate or sorry um, a co- cobalt sulfate or manganese sulfate to make a a, a liquor of nickel manganese and cobalt. It goes through a big it goes through a chemical reaction where they add add in uh, sodium hydroxide or caustic uh, caustic soda. And uh, and it, what it does is it, it all the nickel, manganese, cobalt crashes out as a as a powder as a, uh, as a precipitate, and what's left in solution is a whole bunch of sodium sulfate, um, and that has to be disposed of. And it either has to be dried, um, or it has to be streamed into the ocean or into lakes and rivers, uh, which is uh, really only permitted in a few places in the world, and certainly not in uh, Europe and North America. Um, and uh, and uh, so. All of that, this all happens ever bef- long before ever sees lithium, long before it's actually made into a final cathode material. Our process can go directly from nickel metal uh, or iron metal powder, and it so skips all those steps I just talked about. And so it avoids the sulfate, avoids the sulfate, um, uh, the sulfate uh, waste stream. It avoids the crystallization, the shipping of uh, of um, of those materials, and. Uh, um, and 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 a heavy heavy use of water, so our water consumption is far lower, our energy footprint is far lower uh, as a result, and uh, and we produce zero waste stream, and, and those are really big environmental benefits. They're not, and and all of that happens long before you even make the cathode material, <laughs> essentially. So our process really enables a much um, cleaner and and streamlined supply chain. Okay, thank you. That's that's really helpful. The the grant you've received today. Um, or you've announced today, or um, um, I think it was today, the um, uh, was was quite chunky. It sounds as if you've got um, cash for forty million dollars and grants for ten million dollars. Can you just kind of t- tell me a little bit about that, please? Yeah. So the the grant was actually it's from a Sustainable Development Technology Canada, which is a uh, a technology investment arm of the of uh, the government of Canada, and we announced that actually a couple months ago. It's our third round with them. Um, and the largest chunk we have uh, received from them. Uh, we have already drawn down the first few million on that 10, and we will uh, successively, as we meet milestones, draw down the rest over the next three years. Um, it is aimed, uh, that particular funding is aimed at the um, at the conversion and ramp up of the existing Candiac plant and the building of a uh, of a nickel and manganese uh, pilot line uh, that we were, we are doing in parallel. You can't mix the nickel plant and the, and the iron plants because contamination is a big issue, and and uh, the automotive companies don't want to see any of them touch each other. So you you actually have to have it in a different building. So uh, we're we're tipping up a separate building to uh, to house a nickel, uh, manganese, and cobalt based uh, cathode material pilot line, and that funding is is uh, squarely aimed at uh, at the converting of the existing plant to the one pot as we talked about, and the building of the new one next door. And and the, um, you, t- you talk about forty million dollars in cash. Is is, is, um, what, is, is that your? That's our um, treasury more... right now. So so, okay. so we we went through a, a series of raises over the last uh, last three years. Um, uh, we last raised money two years ago, and 
Uh, and with that, uh, there were a series of, there were some warrants from many years ago. Uh, most of them got exercised in the, in the last, uh, uh, in the last year. And that's kind of kept their treasury hovering between kind of 40 and 50 million over the last, uh, over the last few years. And we are, uh, we remain kind of, uh, floating around the $40 million mark. Our, our burn rate has gone up considerably since buying, um, uh, Cognac. We onboarded 50 people, of course, and we've got a facility there to maintain, um, so we, we can expect to see that getting uh, chewed away a little bit more rapidly. Um, uh, we are we're probably just over twenty million dollars in um, in burn right now uh, with some of the capital expenses that we're considering uh, this year at the at, particularly at the plant. So we we have a relatively healthy treasury. Um, uh, we're not uh, we're not out. Uh, we're not out sort of actively uh, fundraising, although we uh, we are actively talking to uh, Canadian government and and of course strategic interests um, to take uh, take a part in in what we're doing, and so we would welcome uh, kind of any uh, addition to the treasury from uh, those types of sources right now. Um, obviously, uh, we have expansion plans, and there will be capital need going forward in the future, um, but. Uh, and, there, and there's, I think the, the timelines and, and the sense of that are kind of, we tried to lay that out as effectively as we could in the, in the news release this morning. You've got three strategics already in, on your shareholder register. Um, what does the, what does the kind of the, the, the full shareholder register look like, please? S- sorry, me, so, sorry, you know, who else are we working with kind of thing? Is that what you're, uh, well, you're getting Well, I mean, at? Uh, you know, what, how much you've got in retail, kind of institutions? Um, uh, yes. So, sorry, there's a phone ringing in the background. No, the trials have been at home. That thing that r- rarely rings, actually. I know, I know. Mine, mine never does. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we are held. Uh, uh, we're about thirty percent um, held by institutional shareholders, and and the remainder, of course, are uh, are retail and insiders. Um, the uh, the the. Uh, uh, the, the institutional base, um, and there's a, a good few uh, players like Schroeder's and uh, Thematica and Rebecca Sam in Europe. Um, and then we have Formidable and US Global in, in, in Canada. And of course, like we would count Rio Tinto in there as well. They're, uh, they're obviously a different type of investor. Uh, and um, uh, yeah, that's kind of where where we sit right now as our sort of major shareholders. Um, but we uh, and and we was was getting more and more retail interest, or sorry, more and more institutional interest in what we're doing. And we've had a few retail, uh, uh, sorry, institutional groups come in on the on the market, uh, which is great to see. Uh, it's nice to see that kind of confidence in in what we're doing, and uh, we hope to bring more uh, through those means um, uh, as we as we go forward in the next few. You know, months and, and quarters. Uh, talk me through the the rest of the year, please. You know, what are you looking to deliver in terms of milestones, and what should we look out for as um, de-risking milestones or catalysts? I think, as we laid out in the in the um, uh, in in the news release, uh, we're currently trialing uh, the one pot process in, in all the existing equipment in the plant. Uh, we will replace some of those reactors with the new one pot reactors um, um, uh, in in Q three. So those those uh, those units come in, and then we will start to build those out larger and larger, um, and, and taking that plant to about two thousand tons per year. Um, that won't happen immediately. We'll start at two hundred tons, and we'll ramp that up um, over time. So I think that's the first thing. I think it would, I think investors need to look at the catalyst. You know, how quickly do we move towards that? Um, how successful are we? And then uh, we will be uh, using those materials for evaluation with a number of our partners. Um, some of them stated, uh, some of them we, we've uh, we've talked about publicly, and some of them are uh, are sort of in negotiation right now. The intent really is to get to a point where there's offtake. They like the material, they want to buy, uh, you know, uh, a bunch of this material, you know, two years out, um, and that will then uh, that will then uh, be a bankable deal that uh, we can build the next facility on. So we're also in uh, in deep discussions with a whole bunch of different uh, sort of project financiers um, uh, and uh, uh, sort of uh, companies that can uh, help finance the um, the building out of a, a much larger uh, demonstration production facility, which we also talk about in the news release, uh, aiming to be in the kind of ten thousand ton range to start, and that will get us up to a 
sort of a meaningful level for automotive players. It's not enough to feed an automotive plant, but it's um, it's large enough to de-risk the uh, the scale of uh, of manufacturing. And that won't happen in 2023, of course. Um, that will be on the on the tail end of us getting the uh, uh, the offtake from from all the work we're doing in the uh, in the smaller pilot uh, that we're currently retrofitting. So that's it. That's really on, on, the, on the production end. And, and I think uh, you can count on us to, to bring more uh, strategic, strategic partners to the table, um, uh, uh, building our relationships with the OEM uh, market and uh, the, uh, the, the OEMs who'll be working with the material and, uh, and uh, um, ongoing and continued support from both the Canadian government and the, and the U.S. government. Uh, we've got our sort of fingers in there. Um, everywhere. I think uh, everyone recognizes the strategic importance of having cathode manufacturing in North America. And uh, we're seeing quite a bit of support from uh, on either side of the border. Uh, do you ever look at using a different anode apart from the graphite? I mean, because I speak to some companies that are working on a, um, uh, a, a sodium alumina coating or a silicon, um, uh, silicon cathode. Um, yeah. S- so the, 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 so the, the anode material. Uh, so we don't work on anode materials. First of all, um, um, we when we make our test cells, we will typically use lithium as an anode for very short term tests in you know, hundred cycles or so. And if we're going to go take it up to a thousand cycles, we'll typically use graphite as a as an anode. Um, really, our objective here is to test the cathode material. So you don't want to you don't want to add any other sort of noise or uncertainty into the anode. You want to work work with just. Um, something uh, tried and true. The anode players will do the same thing on the cathode side. The anode guys will make anode um, and they'll and they'll just get kind of off the shelf known cathode materials to uh, to work with their anode materials. And that uh, that's sort of typical of how, how it works. The two come together, of course, at the cell manufacturer who then assembles them into a, uh, a battery cell. And in theory, you could work with any kind of anode as long as it does its job. That's correct. So we have a number of programs underway with different uh, types of cell manufacturers who are using different anodes. So they could be... Uh, uh, they could be graphite. They could be silicon. They could be um, uh, they could be niobium based um, uh, or lithium based, sort of as you would get in a, in, a, in a lithium metal battery as well. And our cathode materials will work just as effectively with any of those. And and, and be they in the solid state or liquid state type of battery, um, both of them uh, uh, basically they all need cathode, and we have cathode materials that work with all of them. Um, when I look at mining companies, I'm, I'm I've I, I've, through a lot of experience, I know how to value them. I, I, I can I can run DCFs. I can look at resources, and I can take my technical experience to to evaluate what kind of business it's going to look like. What should I do with uh, Nano One? You know, how should I approach it, or how should an investor approach it? Well, it's, it would, certainly we're 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 quite different than a uh, a mining company, as I described before, but large because a cathode is a performance material. It's not just a it's not just a purity spec. So um, it has to um, it has to undergo a whole bunch of testing evaluation um, in uh, in a battery cell, uh, which has many many other components in it as well. And so uh, they're quite complex uh, devices, batteries, and um, so it, it does take some time to go through. I think the, the key thing here is a, is the uh, uh, what, what investors need to be looking at is that there's a concrete and practical path to uh, to scale up and and production. Every time you scale up by ten times, you need uh, you need to go through a whole series of evaluation uh, um, internally and externally with the materials to make sure that they continue to perform. And so there is a it's it's a long it's a longish game, of course. But uh, I think the the key is here that um, you know we're going after a very big piece of the pie. We're not looking just to be um, an isolated manufacturing plant. Uh, we are uh, we continue to pursue uh, production. Uh, licensing and joint venture as models for uh, for bringing in revenue. Um, however, we have to prove it at a at a large scale manufacturing uh, uh, you know uh, start. Um, and and I think that's really uh, I think it's really clear uh, to investors now that uh, that we're going to get there with our LFP strategy, and it will create the the proof it'll de-risk the technology de-risk the uh, the investments that people have made um and uh and bring the kind of offtake that is going to you know bring much larger growth and again it's not, we're not just trying to uh you know build a plant that uh will feed up a particular customer here we're looking for kind of wide scale expansion we believe that our technology um could 
um, supplant the way that cathode materials are currently made today, change the way the world makes cathode materials, essentially. And that um, that means uh, that we will be in not only uh, working with joint venture partners, we, we could be licensing to... Uh, uh, to similar similar companies um, in in the space um, uh, to help because they're going to need the technology to remain competitive and and uh, we hope that uh, there are many players using our technology moving forward in the uh, in the future. Well, Dan, thank you very much. It's been a, a fascinating introduction. I, again, forgive my ignorance in some of these uh, questions. I'm normally working much further up the uh, the mineral stream. Um, but uh, good luck with the work towards your uh, that 200 ton per day um, facility at Candiac, and it'll be really interesting to see the news coming out um, on on that uh, in Q3 and other uh, other commercial aspects of the business during the course of the year. Great. Well, thank you, Martin. Appreciate the time, and um, look forward to speaking to you again as we advance things in uh, in 2023.